As they exit the stage, it's now my pleasure to introduce our next moderator and, and a really, really good and, and longtime friend of Food Tank, Sam Fromarts from the Food and Environment Reporting Network. Network. Uh, Sam was also previously a journalist for the Washington Post, and he's a wonderful bread maker, although he's never shared his bread with me, but I, this is what I hear, everyone tells me, who came out with a book uh, a few years ago called In Search of the Perfect Lo Loaf. And if you want another good podcast to listen to, Fern, uh, the Food and Environment Reporting Network, just came out with their Hot Farm pad, um, podcast. So Sam, over to you. Thank you so much for being here. Great. Well, it's it's great to be here, and uh, uh, it's quite inspiring to have this focused on uh, uh, D.C. and the uh, and the region, having having lived here since the the mid '90s, um, and uh, and it was also uh, quite inspiring to hear uh, uh, Director Che uh, talk talk earlier about all the gardening initiatives. Um, being an avid urban gardener myself for the past. Uh, 20 years, and one, one thing you learn as a, as a gardener is um, if you keep at it year after year, your soil does improve, and as your soil improves, your, your plants improve, and as your plants improve, you know, what you're eating really improves. But it's a long process, um, and as someone who uh, co-founded a, a journalism nonprofit and then having seen what, what Danny has done with Food Tank over the years since, since she, she formed that, I mean, we're all involved in this sort of um, uh, work that, that goes on every year that changes and grows and that you learn and, and hopefully expands. And having been in this space now since, you know, probably since the early 2000s, I, you know, it is, it is really encouraging to see, to see what's happened and, and how things are changing um, as much as, as, as we have more, more work to do. And on that note, um, we, have a, we have a really fascinating panel, and I think what we're gonna, what we're gonna do here is just get a sense of what um, uh, the UDC community was, is really up to in this space. And I think the people here, whether they're you know, PhD candidates, whether they're part of the university, um, and, and in terms of their work uh, outside of the university as well, um, you know, we wanna, draw those connections uh, from their work and you know how they're addressing issues like food insecurity, sustainability, and even a concept of, of, of creating a new food policy uh, in DC. But maybe we'll just start off, start off broadly with, with Donnie, uh, who could talk about maybe talk about you know how, how you know what UDC itself is doing and how, how you see these, how, how you see these issues being framed. Um, well, UDC, obviously, you know, as you stated before, is the only public university in the nation's capital. And so we do serve everyone from workforce development all the way through to law school and the PhD program. So our student body is quite diverse on all different levels, um, social, economic, <coughs> economic levels, culturally, ethnically, um, racially. And so our university always takes, I think, the foot forward in an effort to be inclusive with everybody. And so we are inclusive with the DC community. Um, we have multiple food hubs inside of every ward in DC, the 400 acre farm in Beltsville, Maryland, the rooftop farm on building 44. So it only made sense since we're so deeply ingrained into the agriculture that is a part of DC in the community that we added a, you know, added a piece of that for our students. Um, with the produce pantry, having the fresh farming program where they learn how to harvest and wash, where they learn how to actually go out and pick the, the food and they understand how it grows, whether it's organic um, in the ground or we're doing hydroponics. Um, I think the students having the opportunity not only to see the range of, guess, the range of skill set that goes into that work, um, also understanding different, different produce, understanding different food cycles, um, cons cons um, consummation cycles. So that allows us to have a whole broad area of education that students <coughs> are not often given. We have a master gardening program. We have a food certification handling program. So all these things come full circle when teaching our students education, leadership development, and skill sets. Yeah, uh, just, just to follow up, I mean, how, is you, how have you seen it 
grown or changed or e even the reception of students to these to considering these issues? Um, the students are very receptive to it. Um, I remember when I first started, I have this, you know, a thing about having only healthy food, different food um, at my events. And some people were like, oh, students aren't going to eat that. You got to have pizza. <laughs> you got to have, you know, this kind of stuff. And the first thing to go is all the healthy food. So I think that we are in a different generation. I think yeah. that most of our students, especially students who are uh, Generation X or, you know, f after our millennial generation, they understand the detriment that has happened from fast food, the genocide that's happened from fast food, the problems with health that are persistent and rampant in our communities, and they're deciding that we don't want that anymore. You have young entertainers who are leaving the entertainment business to go into nutrition and food and holistic food businesses. So I think that you know this generation is, is much more open to saying, okay, well, let's try some Swiss chard, or you know, let's go ahead and see if we can make cauliflower mac and cheese. And so I, I'm, I'm liking their energy, and I appreciate it because it's a lot different than talking to, of course, older people where, you know, my mom would want some bacon in her collard greens. And so we're trying to teach them a different way. Yeah. Okay. Um, and Camille, uh, Camille can, can you break down in, you know, what you see the challenges, um, maybe from your, you know, perch both in, in your work at Martha's Table, but, you know, as, as a graduate student here, um, because I, I assume like from Martha's Table, and maybe people don't know much about the organization, but you see a, 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 a particular slice of, of DC, and you know, I'm, I'm wondering you know, what the challenges are and how you're addressing them. Yes, sure. Um, well, thank you for the question and for having me here today. I think that one of the challenges are, as Sam cast it on it earlier, is that our food system is so diverse, but has very little diversity. Um, we have less, only a little bit of over 1% of black farmers. You saw Chris Bradshaw up here today, so you saw one of less than 10%, 1% in America. Um, myself, I'm a registered dietitian. That's what I do at Martha's Table. Um, myself and Tambor Ray are both diet dietitians, but there's only 2% of black dietitians out there, right? Um, and so when we talk about all the diversity in the fields, we ultimately are missing a lot of diversity as well. Um, and we think about who's in charge of bringing all of us together when it comes to the producer, the consumer. It's really the USDA, right? But the USDA has been doing that at the um, rural level, right, for a very long time. And so this coming into this urban space is very new. Um, the USDA Office of Urban Agriculture has only started in 2018. Um, mm -hmm. And so when we talk about being able to have that support from our governance structures, that's been missing for a while. And so for my um, experience as a public health dietitian, I've had to navigate what it means to work um, in those different complexities and the diversity of our urban systems and in our food systems. And it's been really hard to cha and challenging to navigate. Um, and just to bring that, trickle that down to my experience here at the University of District of Columbia, where we are a land-grant institution, well, I'm, we're a land-grant institution without an Office of Agriculture, right? And so that depends on us to go straight to the USDA to make those relationships to get that funding when it comes to our research and have that support. And so I really think some of those uh, challenges that I'm running into as a student and in a, in a professional are really going back into the structural issues and the policy issues around how we are actually bringing all of the diversity of people when it comes to urban agriculture together to address these solutions. Um, and so yeah, I think that's what I would just like to call attention to. We're doing great work. Um, we have our Food Policy Council. We have a director of urban agriculture now. Um, but I think that there's a lot of work to be done um, even across all of the different cities um, in our major states, especially as they are growing in population and diversifying. And, and so, you know, in terms of this work, if you if you had a wish list, what would what would be like your three items on that of what 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 should be addressed? Um, first and foremost, I would create an office level, uh, excuse me, a office of agriculture that was at the level of the Department of Health, at the same level as the Department of Human Services, because food is that important. Um, and so I think that it needs to be held at that table in those same conversations. In the gov government of in D.C.? In the government of D.C., yes, yeah. to be correct. Um, yes, thank you. I don't want to undermine the efforts that we have been done, but I do think that we need to dig a little bit deeper as it relates to bringing and elevating those um, challenges and solutions together. Um, but that would just be my, I won't give three, I'll just give one. Okay, okay. <laughs> um, and, and Tara, let's move to, to, to your work at, I mean, you have a background in working on food, food related issues. I think DC Central Kitchen, right? Yeah, formerly, yes. Yeah, yeah. And now at the Washington Literacy Center, 
And I'm wondering, um, you, you had talked in our, in our pre-talk about these connections between literacy, education, yeah. and, and I guess really food access um, knowing, yeah. and knowing what to eat. And can you talk a little bit about that, how you think about these issues? Yeah, I'm, I'm going to get a little philosophical for, for a second. There, there are a couple of words that I've been hearing over and over again, but I'm going to start with one that Chris Bradshaw uh, was talking about from Dreaming Out Loud. Uh, and one of the reasons we're all here, the seed. Okay, the, the seed. You know, the seed represents sustainability, but it also, from a spiritual perspective, represents eternity. Okay, going on and on and on. There's a Swahili word for seed called nomo, and it just doesn't just mean something that you plant, it also means knowledge that you plant, that also grows. One of the things that we've been talking about with our communities and one of the works that we do, one of the things we do at Washington Literacy Center is actually partner with organizations like many of you here so that as we try and plant these physical seeds, as we plant these seeds of knowledge in the community, we act as that bridge between the, the supplier and the community to make certain that everything that is presented to them, all the new knowledge that they are gaining is done in a culturally representative and responsible way. Um, that, that, that's what we do. Uh, my former family, we talked about DC Central Kitchen, has, has a mission statement. I think that many of us here actually would subscribe to and believe to. So th this is a shout out to you, DC Central Kitchen. But, but, but DC Central Kitchen's mission is using food as a tool to strengthen bodies, empower minds, and build communities. And I like to tag on to that you know, using food and education and knowledge and learning as tools to strengthen bodies, empower minds, and build communities. And without that knowledge component, without those partners with these organizations to make certain that that learning component is happening with our communities, that all these policies are actually being translated in a culturally sensitive way so that the end users can, can really assimilate and, and use this, then that sustainability, that eternity from generation to generation may not happen as efficiently as we want. Um, something I was telling Holly, who was up here earlier, part of that, that, that knowledge, uh, you were mentioning that one of the, the, the dreams and goals that you have is to see, see it communicated to, to communities that food can be used as medicines. Well, we were actually part of that kind of a learning uh, initiative here in Southeast DC that's actually called Produce RX. I'm not certain if you're familiar with that, but, but just making certain that the public not only knew about uh, where, where, where folks could actually get food uh, prescriptions, take them to their local giant in Congress Heights and actually trade that in for fresh produce, those things actually have to be communicated, those things have to be taught, and our communities have to be made aware. Yeah, and uh, you know, and also as okay, let's give him a shout out. Um, and in terms of that, that culturally specific knowledge, I mean, take your point about the produce prescriptions. I mean, do you, do you see that that that's happening? That translation is happening, or that that sensitivity is happening? Well, well I don't know that it, it that it is as efficiently as effectively as as it needs to to happen. You know, as I look at organizations like Bowery Farms, as I look at you know organizations like like uh, Wanda that Tambro was talking about and Ronnie, who actually employ folks who are from the community to not only provide jobs but also to act as ambassadors to go back out to the community right okay mm -hmm. in a sustainable way to actually teach the community about what they're doing to get them more engaged i don't see that happening enough and i think that that needs to be uh, part of any policy plans of how to incorporate members from the community to actually go back and teach the community about about what needs to be done All right okay Maya, let's turn to you and yeah. your work at uh, Feeding America, and and also maybe your you know your work here at UDC. But I'm curious, you know, how you see these connections between what's happening in, in DC, but also large larger food policy issues that you're that you're involved in. And I'm not sure people in the audience know what Feeding America is, so maybe you could talk about that a little bit. Yeah, and um, whoa, I'll talk a little louder. <laughs> But um, I first just want to say it's an honor to be on this stage and to not only represent Feeding America, but also be a student, a PhD student here at uh, UDC. Um, if you're not familiar with Feeding America, we are one of the largest um, hunger relief nonprofits covering all counties across the nation. Uh, we work very closely with 200 food banks across the nation, including Alaska, Hawaii, um, and Puerto Rico. And one of the things that I will say in the conversations that I'm continuing to hear is this focus on the power of the community. Um, when COVID-19 happened and school districts were closed and schools could not operate, 
our food bank stepped up in a way, an incredible way I've never seen before. Um, I'm on the government relations team, the legislative team with Feeding America, and I've been with the organization before um, for five years, and I've never seen our network operate in a whole different way than they had over the past two years. And the reason why I put the, the conversation in the power of the community, because what we've seen is as COVID-19 happened, there were long lines at pantries. Um, there was so much collaboration that happened with many of you um, here today in the community. And a lot of the disparities happened at the ground level when we're talking about populations such as African American households, Native American households, and other disproportionate households that suffered the most. And a lot of conversations I'm hearing is the work is moving forward, especially as we think about urban communities. There's a lot of rich and wonderful initiatives that are moving forward, but there are also a lot of opportunity areas as well. And from someone sitting on the legislative team, what I've seen that needs to be forward and what Camille has even talked about is this point around policy. How can we make these policy changes, not only at the local level, the state level, but also the national level. When we think about federal programs such as SNAP and TFAP and summer feeding and after school feeding, these are critical federal programs for households that are facing the greatest disparities. And so when you ask me um, from a feeding American standpoint and you know some of those opportunity areas, it does include really pushing the power um, in this key legislation around the farm bill really putting the hands back into local communities, local growers and producers, and telling USDA, we need to put the voices at the center of the table and make some of these key changes. We can't just be making decisions at the top, but how do we empower the community to help us make some of these changes? Another opportunity area is um, really leveraging some of the wonderful work that's happening with USDA, but again, how do we center that focus with bringing all of our communities together? Um, and I will just end here lastly, uh, switching my Feeding America hat on and putting my PhD hat on, but I am really, really excited from a student perspective is to really ground my research in the power of the voice. I love stories. I think we can talk all day about the numbers. What have we done? How many pounds have we moved? How many meals have we served? But at the end of the day, if we're able to center the voice of those who are standing in lines, the children that may show up that don't have um, a snack or a lunch, um, if we're able to get some of those voices at the center of the table and to hear those stories, that's where I think a lot of the opportunities areas lie, and that's why I'm very excited um, about my research moving forward. Okay, my well, yeah, well, th well, thank you. Um, and this was actually a really inspiring uh, panel. <laughs> and I'm sorry to say we have to we have to wrap it up. But one 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 takeaway I did get is just this really this message about com community empowerment, and. Um, and actually, it feels like a hopeful message. As much as we talk about how things are screwed up in the food system, I mean, I think it was, it's, it's a real hopeful message you guys are bringing. I think to we're going to get there. We have, we have eating for education here, so we try yeah, to yeah, grow we'll produce. Get there. We'll get there. <laughs> yeah, we'll get there. <laughs> okay, thank you so much, Pat. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much to Sam and all of our panelists. It was so inspiring. I love that point about storytelling. That is, is, is so needed and we need to hear different voices and we need to bring different voices to the table. Um, I'm also so inspired to hear about the incredible work going on at UDC. And it's just a great reminder that I'm so honored to for Food Tank to be able to partner with UDC. Thank you again for that.